population. One <laughs> percent of the population. <laughs> familiarize yourself with the plants always smell it feel the texture of it and uh, in cases where it's an edible thing you'll, you'll taste it so usually when you crush this up enough it uh, you'll get like an oxima smell that this uh, plant has medicinal purposes and it has uh, ed uh, some edibility but it's like some people use it for a tea but that's usually for a medicinal purpose like when you've got a cold or flu uh, it's got uh, insect repellent qualities, you can rub it on your skin, but you've got to watch because depending on uh, your skin ses sensitivity and stuff, sometimes you'll develop a rash. So a lot of times just take a little bit of it, see if you have a reaction to it. Yeah. You've got like a bleeding injury or something. It, it's got uh, an astringent uh, quality to it so that it sort of tightens the capillaries and stuff like that so it helps stop bleeding. This is a real good tea here. This is called uh, sweet, fern. sweet Fern. It makes a real nice mild tea. If you're into bush teas and stuff, this is really good stuff. They used to use it to, to line baskets and stuff like that just to, because it had a very, very nice sweet smell to it. There's you got the oxide daisy. This whole plant pretty much is edible. Flowers. I like the leaves. The, ba the basil leaves in some of the high-end restaurants, they used to add these to the salads and stuff like that. Take, uh, take if you don't have any food allergies. Taste to it. Mm. Taste the flower. Yeah. Just, just look, examine it because sometimes there's bugs in it. Just that it's not as bad as you, you figured it's going to be. Found is the most effective for poison ivy is uh, 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 jewel weed or spotted jewel weed, I guess they would call it. Uh, and you usually find that in places in swampy areas or in places uh, where there's lots of mosquitoes because in the bush, just about everywhere that you have. A bad thing, there's a good thing to counteract it within an arm's reach. In a lot of uh, books, they'll tell you that the root is edible. What you do is you look for the adult plant, but it's not the adult plant you harvest. You look for the rosette of the young plants. Here's some here. Usually they have a reddish tinge. If you dig these up, these ones here are probably not big enough, but I might be able to get, get the root here. There we go. Now you clean that off. Get your chow down on that. You'll see it's a, it's a kind of a peppery carrot taste. There's a little bit of a delay between when you start eating it till the afterbite of the pepperiness. It's actually quite good. Yeah, it is. This one here you, is called bunchberry. And it usually has a cluster of red um, berries, and I'll show you some later. When you're kids, everybody used to tell you the red berries are poisonous. They're not poisonous. You can just grab the whole handful, and what you'll find is they've, they've got a really large pit in them, but you eat them pit and all, and uh, you can sustain yourself on them. These are edible too, but some people don't like the texture of them because it's got like a peach-like fuzz on them. If you bust one of those blisters with your knife, just the point of your knife, if you cut yourself, get a bad cut in the bush, once you get the bleeding control, take that and put it right over the top of it. It's got an antibacterial uh, uh, quality to it. And I found when I've had really serious cuts in the bush and put that over the top and then put a, a Band-Aid or whatever I'm going to use to cover it, decrease the healing time needed to heal your wound. And it also sort of, when it dries, it sort of puts a, a protective cover over just like a uh, a bandage or something. Uh, yeah, that's the bunch berry. So those red berries on this. Uh, real good, uh, Everybody always, uh, you know, thinks that this is poisonous, but it's actually edible and uh, it's pretty good. People actually make jam with it and stuff like that. I, it's actually one of my favorites. So. Yeah, very good. Not bad, eh? Yeah, very good. Yeah. Little bunch berry action. Actually, really tasty. Yeah. Never eat the red berries. That's a lie. Type of tree I use quite often in the wintertime. And it's got everything you need for fire. And if you're stopping just to make tea and warm up, you, you, you make a bark fire with this. 
and the bark fire, ju just the bark itself, not using the wood, will burn probably an hour, hour and a half. So it's enough to warm you up and make a cup of tea before you move on to the next place. But if you had to, you could use the punk wood in combination with this and you can basically have a wood supply for the night. You're not going to have a massive fire, but you'll have enough of a fire to keep you alive. So if you look underneath, big piles of grindings, especially in places where you've got woodpecker holes like this here. And those usually be pretty dry. The downside of this is when it, when it rains or something, it gets wet and it's almost unusable. But the good news is it dries out very fast too. So usually if you harvest this on the south side, or the, the south facing side of the tree, uh, it usually dries off much faster. So if you harvest it from the south side, it's usually pretty dry. Now, the, the good thing about this is there's a lot of uh, uh, materials here that you can harvest just with your hands and fingers with no need of, for a knife or anything. If you just scrape your, your fingernails in it or, or, or break it like this and pull, you'll notice you get these long paper-like strips. And you notice there's, there's quite a bit of it. This is very easy to harvest by hand, as you can see. So now you've got yourself your instant bird's nest to start your fire. Just spread the fibers a little bit so that you can get some air in them. You make a little center piece and you find some of these grindings or you get the punk wood and you just process it so it's down smaller and you add it, add it in. And you can also use this to repel insects in, in the spring. So now what you do is you add pieces of your, your bark in, in a teepee fashion to get it going. And you get the idea. Usually when people go for birch bark, they'll just rip whatever's on the tree, but for your primitive fire starting stuff, you're looking for that really fine tinder, similar to your fire trees. So if you go in the lower layers or in the in-between layers, you can actually peel thinner and thinner pieces. And uh, the bird nest we were talking about, that's the kind of stuff that you're gonna wanna mix in. So this thing, bird nest we keep talking about, that's all your fine tinders. This is a beaked hazelnut. If you unwrap that, but you've got to watch when you use your, your hands, I would suggest putting some gloves on and taking your knife to it because uh, it's got fine little spines on it and they'll, they'll end up in your fingers and they'll bug the hell out of you. So uh, that is, uh, you can dry those and eat the, the flesh, flesh of the nut in, inside. But green like that, they're not real great, but it's part What's, of what time of the year would they be good? I, I would say towards the fall would be best, if, but by that time they might be scavenged over by, by chipmunks and squirrels and stuff like that. When I was doing primitive skills in the bush, a lot of times you were doing spark-based fires where you, you would take nothing but your knife or you'd, you'd have a magnesium flint. And a lot of times the striker that they give you with a magnesium flint is shit. So you would use the edge of your, your knife, but sometimes if uh, the knife was packed away in your pack or something, you would look for a sharp rock, usually a quartz-based rock with a sharp edge, like this one here, and you'd rub this down your, your uh, flint or your magnesium. So this is just a sharp stone. That works pretty good. When I start a fire with my knife, you gotta get the edge just right. You saw a couple of sparks, there, mm -hmm. not many. That method with the knife and stone, I would face into the wind so that it would blow the spark into my tinder that I hold with my thumb on top of this rock. Uh, now on the internet, uh, people are calling it chaga and they, they're using it uh, for health, health reasons and stuff like that. A lot of times when you go into the bush, you'll find, like this one here is pretty much finished, but around the edges sometimes you'll find this gold color and it's dry to the touch and that's immediately usable. This uh, plant here that you see growing in the moss, and it's usually in spruce swamps or, or cedar swamps that you'll find this. This is a medicinal plant. 
and it's easier to harvest when you find it in, in a moss setting because what you do is you reach into the moss and pull it up and you'll see these golden threads you see this one here that's part of the root of one of the one of those plants I, I was pointing out so this is one of the gold thread plants so so what you do is just break off the piece you only need like maybe that much so you take a piece of that and you just pop in your mouth and chew on it but you'll find very quickly when you've got a, a canker sore or a sore throat that it seems to soothe it gathering my my medicinal plant i put everything back in place so that the next time i need something it's going to be there for me if i just leave it and everything dies well you know you, you've shown a lack of respect for the thing and the next time you come it's not going to be there for you so in the bush it's all about respect cedar is one of the biggest gifts we have when, when it comes to fire usually when if you're in a cedar swamp you'll find everything you need to, to start fire tinder wise you've got everything you need right in the right in the cedar bark i don't like to harvest a lot of live cedar there's usually a dead cedar around that you can find but for the beginning the, the your finest piece of tinder to start off in your bird's nest that catches the spark very easily or goes to flame immediately I use, I take the back strap of my knife, like this, and you just rub it. You put your hand underneath it. And I'll take it from different parts of the tree so I'm not damaging too much. Now if you, if you see this, see it's kind of airy and, and if you hold it in your hand you can actually feel the heat on it because of the dryness of it. the wind do its job here. Now if I had a bird's nest you could blow that into a flame. Hey guys Doug and Jamie Pine Tree Line Outdoors. We are here in the back country north of Sudbury and we're here with a couple of friends of ours Mike and Jason father and son who run Keepers of the Wild which is a great uh, outdoors uh, company that does so many different things and the one thing that we're focused on doing today is honing some of our uh, non-existent bushcraft skills as we've uh, been finding out. I mean, so much to learn, Jamie. Yes, it's a great skill and knowledge to have of the bush. We're learning about fire starting predominantly, but we've learned about edible plants, uh, some medicinal plants, uh, and we're just like scratching the surface. We've been out uh, hiking to this lake, which is probably just like a 20 minute uh, hike, but we've been, it's been a couple hours because we've been learning so much along the way. Mm -hmm. It's been fantastic. I know I'm learning a lot. What about you? Oh yeah, I've learned a lot, especially with these plants. Like, who knew? Like, I mean, there's so much to learn. See the coal here? So what you do is you pick that up with the tip of your knife and put it into your into your uh, tinder bundle. this so it catches the birch bark on fire. Don't press too hard. This goes around your around your knee and, and you can butt it right up against there so you, you've got real good control. Okay. You can move this one up just your knee right behind your, your foot. That close, yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be that close. Whether it was comfortable for you. I'd rather go a little wider stance. Yeah. Good, 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 good. I'll tell you when to start. Go, 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 go. Okay, stop. And pull it up very gently. Very gently. Perfect. Almost 
start hearing it. It's a little harder when it, you start hearing it roar. Hear it roaring? It's a little hard. Almost there. The wind will do it on its own. I'm here with Jason Podcat, owner operator of Keepers of the Wild. Jason, tell us about your business. Yeah, basically we're a wilderness adventure outfitter, uh, eco tourism business uh, based out of the Sudbury area. So, uh, you know, we run a variety of uh, adventure events on a year-round basis. Uh, so there's something for everybody uh, year-round. So uh, winter we can get people outside uh, doing some adventurous stuff. Um, like you mentioned, uh, we do uh, bushcraft school, uh, teaching some wilderness uh, education and uh, horses. Uh, don't really like to say survival, but uh, it shouldn't be survival if, uh, if you know what you're doing, right? Absolutely. Um, other than that, we do uh, some guided fishing, guided hunting, uh, just general guiding services, destination events. One of the main goals is just to kind of unite people and get people uh, together, uh, meeting new people and uh, get people outdoors trying to bring back some of the uh, the primitive uh, skills and uh, kind of like uh, the original knowledges you know uh, yeah we do uh, private uh, group bookings so uh, if you've got something you want to do or uh, let's say some skills you want to work on or something specific um, you know uh, get a hold of us uh, let us know what you want to do and uh, we can definitely put something together for you uh, another thing I want to mention is the keepers of the wild network that we uh, were working on so uh, it's not just us at Keepers of the Wild, like uh, we're working in partnership with uh, other outfitters, other uh, groups like First Nations groups, uh, you know, skilled bush persons, uh, kind of anybody uh, that has something to offer, which is just about everybody out there, right? So the idea is, is the, uh, the circle uh, of the network at Keepers of the Wild. Uh, it's a platform for everybody to come and share their gifts and share their knowledge. www.keepersofthewild.ca Right on. And you can find us on uh, Facebook. All right, Jamie, you have earned the ultimate bushcraft uh, trophies. It's and been Mike, handed down to me. Handed down to you by Mike, who uh, is an expert in bushcraft and in lighting fires with a bow drill. Uh, you did it, man. How did, uh, how did it yeah, feel? How did you feel? It, um, it feels uh, invigorating. Yeah. Uh, it felt good. And to know that, uh, you know what, um, it's, I got the technique now. All I got to do is practice. Anyway, it was a great time. Uh, thanks to Mike. Thanks to Jason, uh, Keepers of the Wild. Check them out. Go to the website, keepersofthewild.ca. And don't be afraid to contact them uh, if there's anything you're interested in. And their basic message is simple. They want everybody to get out and enjoy the outdoors. Thanks for having us today, guys. Like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. PTL on Outdoors. PTL Outdoors, the website. And we're on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook, of course. Anyways, until next time. Good job, buddy. Good job. Take care. See you guys.